So we will now uh, move on to, uh, to the second talk and the final talk in the session. Uh, the talk is by Birgit Stiller and it's on coherent light sound interactions in waveguides. Uh, Birgit Stiller is an experimental physicist. Uh, she's the leader of a uh, independent Max Planck research group on quantum photoacoustics at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen. She received her PhD degree from uh, CNRS uh, uh, in uh, Besançon, France, and uh, she was one of the pioneers on studying gruon scattering in photonic crystal fibers. She then held postdoctoral positions with Gerd Loix in Erlangen and uh, uh, Benjamin er Angleton in, in Sydney uh, before uh, taking up her current positions uh, in, in Erlangen. So, uh, Dr. Stiller, uh, uh, we are waiting for your talk and we're looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Let me share my screen. Right. All right. So thanks a lot for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank um, Robert Boyd and Paul Corkham for inviting me. To, to give the presentation here at the Charlotte House Symposium. It's a great honor to me. And I will um, talk today about coherent light sound interaction in waveguides. Um, as I think that the audience is mostly out of the um, photonics um, community, you, you, were, you know very well your business in light and optical waves, but maybe you're not so familiar with um, mechanical and acoustic waves. So when you think about sound waves, you might think about uh, music, about instruments. So I show you here some um, resonate, resonator modes of a resonance box of a, of a guitar. They depend on the geometry and on the material of, of the instrument and at different um, frequency, you have different um, mode shapes. They are basically standing waves um, of a resonance box. Now also in optical wave guides, guides, you can have acoustic waves and mechanical waves. And um, for example, these three types of, um, of waves, this is a, this is a flexural um, and wave where you see the, the geometrical change, but actually not so much change in the density. Um, this is a pressure wave. It's a typical longitudinal acoustic wave. And this is different from the resonances here of the, of, of, uh, um, of the guitar because these are resonator, these are standing waves. In this case, these are traveling waves along the, the waveguide. And you see the density changes here at, uh, at the periodic positions. And then there are shear waves, which are again a bit similar to the guitar modes because this depends on the geometry on the, on the, on the transverse section of the waveguide. And we are mostly dealing with these two types of waves because it's here where the density changes a lot and with the density also the refractive index changes a lot. So now a very um, uh, important um, effect of light and sound waves is Brion scattering. And you might think um, since these are so different waves in terms of physics, um, sound waves need a material to propagate, Electromag electromagnetic waves propagate through the vacuum and have also very different um, propagation speed and, or, and frequencies. But in a certain frequency range, um, these, the wavelength of both waves are in the same order of magnitude in the micrometer range. And that is why in certain cases, uh, the microstructuring of a material can help to enhance this interaction. Now, as I said, uh, one of the popular um, uh, phenomenon is Brion scattering. And here you see a typical uh, scattering spectrum and there's Rayleigh scattering which is elastic um, scattering from density changes which are steady. And um, Brion scattering this is due to uh, acoustic waves. This is, has a frequency shift of some gigahertz and then far out Raman scattering in, uh, which has a frequency change of uh, a shift of terahertz. Raman scattering is due to optical phonons which are based on um, vibrations of uh, intermolecular vibrations. Embryo scattering is based on acoustic phonons. Um, and it has actually been predicted almost 100 years ago in um, 1922 by Brion and some day, um, years later by Mandelstam. And with the invention of the laser, um, Brion scattering was observed in different um, materials 
soon after awesome optical fibers where it was already predicted that this will be a problem in telecommunication and then the first brion laser was um, uh, was built based on the very thin brion line width and then there was a break in uh, uh, let's say in in the new um, new materials um, until the invention of the photonic crystal fibers where finally um, microstructured fibers and waveguides and um, then further on resonators could be fabricated with a high precision. About at the same time, um, as uh, Jochen Guck already mentioned, embryon spectroscopy um, uh, was invented and there was also possible to use it um, for um, to, to, uh, to image and um, biological tissues. So brion scattering has a um, wide, wide application field actually um, in communications, chip integration, energy management, sensing, and finally in biomedical imaging. This can be found in uh, the different um, uh, sub-communities like uh, working on microwaves, photonics, brion lacing, um, light storage, or bri brion distributed sensing is a very lively field. So I would like to give uh, some basics on the physics of brion scattering um, before um, starting to talk about the challenges and the chances that we currently see using um, this effect. Brion scattering is inelastic scattering, so depending on the angle, the angle there's a different frequency shift. As we are mostly interested in waveguides, um, we, we deal um, with forward scattering and with backward scattering. And forward scattering, if you're familiar with this, is in some sense similar to cavity optomechanics because it relies on, on uh, standing waves of, of a resonator of the, the transverse section of the waveguide. However, backward scattering is quite different and I will come to this. And so uh, you can imagine forward brion scattering, um, it's often also called Raman-like scattering based on these type of modes. Um, basically, the transverse section of the fiber is uh, breathing, it's changing. There are radial symmetric modes and torsional radial symmetric modes. In a dispersion diagram, um, the scattering happens in one um, optical mode. And the scattering um, can be cascaded. So you always scatter into the same mode, um, um, passing by the same acoustic mode. In a low power um, pump power regime, there is an anti Stokes and a Stokes part. And if we go to very high powers, then there's a cascading possible. This is possible because we always couple to the same um, acoustic um, wave vector. This is different for backward brion scattering, which is due to longitudinal acoustic modes. Here we scatter into a backward optical um, mode and um, the wave vector is uh, different if you change the frequency. And so in the low power and pump power uh, regime, there's also the Stokes and anti-Stokes part. And if we get to a higher pump power, we get into a stimulated um, regime where the Stokes en enhances uh, exponentially. So no cascading is possible. And in the stimulated brion scattering regime, there are two um, effects that are important. The photoelastic effect, which is basically that the sound waves influence the light waves. So this is um, the compressive strength changes also a, a, um, a change in refractive index. On the other hand, electrostriction um, means that the light influences the sound because the electric field causes a material compression. This is um, important for bulk materials and for um, standard optical fibers because here the sound waves um, propagate in the fiber core so far away of, of the boundaries. If you get to the nanoscale, the microscale, um, so to, to nanoscale um, structures, then also radiation pressure um, is, is important. And here the light is scattered from moving boundaries. And this radiation pressure depends entirely upon the geometry of the fiber. So we have both photon phonon coupling based on electrostriction and on radiation pressure. And especially in these types of structures where you go to very thin um, webs in optical fiber or on the suspended um, chip waveguides. Um, it's important to consider both of them. In the last 15 years, um, brilliant scattering has been shown in very different types of um, platforms. As I mentioned, photonic crystal fibers in resonators, uh, nano scale micro or microfibers with a diameter of one micrometer and, and lower, and in on, on a chip scale. 
And in the last two years, there were also some um, very exciting work happening, for example, we on optomechanics in superfluids or um, in crystalline materials with very uh, long coherence length. Um, it has entered the strong coupling regime of brion scattering. And this is also an interesting um, a publication on an acoustic metamaterial where they managed to get a, um, a, a very high frequency brion mode of 300 gigahertz. This is a gyroscope based on brion scattering. So very exciting works happening at the moment in this field. So what are the challenges and chances that we face and that we um, yeah, would like to use in our research? Um, one limitation is the bandwidth. Um, this is determined by the acoustic lifetime, but it can be broadened with tricks, um, which is necessary if you want to use um, short pulses. Um, the acoustic lifetime is um, limited and determined by material, the geometry and the temperature. So this puts us also some limitations on some projects. Um, the gain, uh, ideally, um, we want to have is um, very large, and this depends on the effective length of the, of the um, waveguides or the fibers, the um, effective area, and the prior and gain coefficient, which depends on these parameters. I want to mention the refractive index, which goes into it with, uh, to the power of 8, and the um, optoacoustic overlap. So this eta is not viscosity, this is the overlap of the optical and the acoustic waves which have to be basically at the same position. So here you see that in a multi-scale photonic crystal fiber or in a um, soft glass photonic waveguide where sound waves and optical waves are confined at the same position. This turns out to be challenging. It's not possible in all materials. Um, what I would call a chance is the string and phase matching condition because this enables multi-frequency experiments. And I will go into this um, on some slides. So now a very typical experiment uh, of brion scattering is, is sketched here. You basically send in um, a laser light amplified by an airborne dot amplifier, which enters then a fiber device under test. You have a look at the backscattered signal, um, which you um, may um, interfere with the local eye uh, oscillator. And then you see this uh, nice uh, Lorentzian um, gain profile. Now, in this case, you get the answer of the whole device. So you don't know what happens at the different positions. And you also um, have, let's say, always the light on because this is a CW um, laser. Now, there are different setups where you can circumvent um, this kind of um, integrated uh, response of the, of, the, uh, of the device. For example, if you use um, pump pulses, then you have, so to say, a, a localized um, uh, interaction on this, on this waveguide, which you can then see, um, for example, on an oscilloscope. One particular um, uh, setup that interests us a lot is to use pulsed light on both sides. Um, so instead of having um, continuous wave light um, on both sides, since this is a counter-propagating interaction, um, we use pulses. And this um, was first shown in this paper in 2007, actually by Robert Boyd. And um, it was used to, um, to store light information into acoustic waves. And how does this work? Um, we can in, um, encode information on one um, light wave, on one light pulse on, on, on one end of the waveguide, and have the control pulse on the other side. When they, face, when they are face matched and they encounter each other in the waveguide, they create acoustic phonons. Then it can be read out by a second read, read, uh, readout pulse, and then the information has a delay of several nanoseconds. Now, the advantage of this um, setup is that we are at some point only in the acoustic domain. So, if there's anything happening there, we can um, sense this and read it out again. This is not possible with continuous light. We are interested in this concept because this works for all wavelengths where the glass is transparent. So, the light chooses basically the corresponding acoustic um, waves which are phase matched. They're not restricted to resonances of a resonator and it's a string and phase matching condition that I um, pointed out. Moreover, in a stimulated regime, it's coherent. I would like to point out that this is not slow light based on brilliant scattering because here the information is always only in the optical domain. And it's also not um, storage based on optomechanical resonators 
because here we would be um, limited in bandwidth and to the resonances of the resonator. In an experiment, this would um, look like this. We can encode the information, for example, on a, on a pulse. And when we send in the control pulses, the information gets depleted. Here it is transferred to an acoustic phonon and you can read it out again after several nanoseconds. This is possible because the difference of the sound and the light velocity is uh, about five orders of magnitude. So we have this time to temporarily park the information there. And depending on the difference of these control pulses, uh, we can tune the, this, uh, this memory. Um, to show the coherence, um, we first show that it is linear in the amplitude, which is important, for example, for telecommunication systems, and that we are able to store the optical phase. Uh, this measurement shows um, two pulses with a different phase of zero and pi and pi and zero. And when we switch on the process, we can delay um, these, these two pulses by several nanoseconds and still get the information. It's also possible to do this in a cascaded fashion, so to position this at different positions in a fiber or in a chip. Now, um, one of our goals was to try to overcome come the limitation of the acoustic lifetime, because when um, you see this in this, uh, in this uh, conventional scheme, when we send in, when we have the acoustic, build up the, the acoustic weight, but when we send in the second pass too late, we are not able to detect the information in, in, anymore because the acoustic wave has dissipated into the material. So we were thinking about a scheme to keep this acoustic wave alive and to transfer energy to, this, uh, to, the, to the acoustic wave. So this is possible to use, um, uh, to use optical refresh passes to reinforce this. I want to mention that the information is only in the acoustic wave so these are coherent optical pulses, but they don't write the information again. They just reinforce the acoustic phonons. And therefore, it is possible to have a much longer um, storage time and to also enhance the efficiency of this um, storage concept. Um, for the ones that are from the field, um, we put the write and read pulses uh, at this position and where we expect Brillouin loss, so it's a, a frequency upshifted by the Brillouin frequency shift, the data pulses and the reinforcement pulses are positioned. The first thing was to see if we can improve our efficiency and with, uh, in the conventional system with zero refresh pulses, the, the efficiency is pretty low but with, uh, with several refresh passes, we can enhance this. Um, what was more important to us, it, is this also possible to, uh, to do for a much longer time than the acoustic lifetime? And here you see, and um, we can detect um, the information even after 40 nanoseconds. Of course, we needed to double check um, all the different combination of pulses to be sure that this information comes really from our data. So we did not write the right data and send in the reinforcement pulses. We wrote the data, but we didn't send it the reinforcement pulse and all, all different combinations. But the ultimate proof is to find the information coherently. So that's what we did here. We had again two pulses with a phase shift, zero and pi. And only here the coherent information was written. Then afterwards, the, the reinforcement pulses didn't contain any information, additional information. And we can still um, observe this, this phase after 40 nanoseconds. I would like to mention that in this case, we operate the system um, to, to keep the information alive. But we could also um, encode these reinforcement pulses, these refresh pulses, such that they do signal processing on the acoustic phonon while it's sitting there. What are the limitations of this concept? Um, first of all, um, spontaneous prion scattering uh, due to the um, uh, refresh pulses. They amplify uh, temp uh, room temperature phonons. And another important thing is that we don't, we don't have delta peaks as refresh pulses. So every time this grating is refreshed, um, the acoustic dynamic grating is broadened a little bit. And so at some point, let's say it runs out of the, the, the chip if we have a short waveguide. And other um, limitations, more of an experimental view, is the extinction rate of the intensity modulators, because between the pulses, they act like a seed for brilliant scattering and the detection capability of the photodetector. And we estimated that we should 
uh, it should be possible to extend the storage time to 350 nanosecond and beyond. This has yet to be proven in experiments. I would like to come to the string and phase matching condition. Why is this interesting? Um, now, we have a waveguide, so we basically talk to a continuum of acoustic phonons. This is not like in a mechanical resonator where we have certain mechanical modes. This means that each of, um, each of the wavelengths of the frequency talk to a different set of acoustic phonons. So we can imagine this like a dual channel um, interaction, for example. So if we have data on two different frequency and the corresponding control process, we can encode the information in the acoustic waves and they can travel at the same position and they are very close in frequency as well. But when we read them out, we can um, discouple them again. So there is very, there's a negligible crosstalk between these two frequency channels. How is this actually possible? Because one of the things that we calculated at some point is that if we have two frequency channels, which are separated by only 25 gigahertz, the acoustic phonons uh, overlap quite a lot in the acoustic domain. Here, um, it's about one megahertz and the lightness is 30 megahertz. The reason is uh, the wave number mismatch. So if you imagine an acoustic wave that has been written, totally face matched on one position, and then we send in um, the, the read pulse, it goes through the acoustic phonons while, uh, through the, the, while, while the interaction length, and if it's not face matched, then it accumulates this uh, mismatch from the beginning to the end, and basically it ends to be very inefficient. So this can be seen here. If it, everything is face matched, the acoustic phonon um, goes down and the read out um, builds up again. If it's not face matched, then this is very inefficient. So therefore, um, for two channels that are about 25 gigahertz apart, there's almost no crosstalk. Not, a, not detectable, at least. We checked this um, for uh, experimentally. On channel one is always the, um, the storage happening. And on the second channel, um, we sent through a data and it is not um, uh, distorted at all, which means that this is not interacting with the acoustic phonons at the, uh, in the waveguide. Also, on the other hand, the control pulses of the second channel can't interact with the acoustic phonon and we don't see any, uh, any readout. Obviously, if we get closer and if you have shorter pulses, this changes, but we can control this with our interaction. So this is nothing um, that the, um, is arbitrary. So it's not like in a resonator where uh, all the different wavelengths couple to uh, one mechanical mode, but we can actually control this. So this is the crosstalk depending on the pulse bandwidth and the channel separation. Um, a similar argument, um, is valid for the non-reciprocity because instead of using two wavelengths we could also use two propagation directions and if in one direction we um, we send the control pulses through we can uh, delay the pulse and on the other side the data pulse is not reacting at all with the acoustic phonon and just passes through it there's no delay and also no distortion this is again due to the phase mismatch of the wave vectors these are the experiments to that. So in one direction, we have a original pulse and a normalized delay pulse. And in the other direction, there's no distortion. So this is, might be interesting um, yeah, for non-reciprocal non um, um, interactions because we, we showed that um, the, the isolation is about 10 dB if we go to the back, back um, what direction. What is also interesting, or a, a limit, is the bandwidth, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, because it's only 30 megahertz wide. Now, first of all, people told that this is not possible for shorter pulses, um, but even for nanosecond long pulses, we could retrieve um, um, certain uh, de details of the, of the pulse. So that mo this motivated us to go to even shorter interaction lengths, and that is um, basically our record result. Um, where we um, could um, in, uh, store 150 picosecond long pulses over 100 pulse width. So if you compare this to brion based slow light, and um, there it's only possible over one or two um, pulse width. This is another um, measurement for 200 picosecond pulse width. 
and we see here that there is something um, strange. So it's not an exponential decay anymore. And first we thought this might just be a, a, yeah, something in the experiment, but we can reproduce this. If we um, have a, a shorter tuning of the pulses, we see that for shorter pulses, we get this oscillation, which disappears for nanosecond pulses. Now the question is, where does this come from? And there are different uh, possible explanations. Either we couple to a transverse acoustic mode, we have maybe several acoustic modes interfering, or, which is much more interesting to us, that is from a fundamental point of view, that this is the breakdown of the slowly varying envelope, and that's, that we need to take into account also a um, higher order um, uh, uh, um, uh, derivations in, the, in, in our coupled mode equations. And um, this would, uh, our simulation actually showed that this would lead to such a, such a, um, a um, yeah, interference pattern. And now I will give a short outlook. So these are all the things um, that we are uh, caring about at the moment, but we are also interested um, in uh, doing um, brion interaction in the quantum domain, where we would like to um, get into the strong coupling regime and uh, ideally to, to the coherent coupling regime and um, try to transfer some of the um, concepts that are already uh, that are already well established in the in the optomechanics community um, to the effect of brion scattering. Another um, interesting project is um, to study sound rays in liquid core capillary rays in a, in a very small surface and where we also use um, something uh, that I mentioned in the beginning is a distributed measurement system, which is um, the brion optical correlation domain analysis. Here we, have, um, we, we can see very localized, even more localized than with the memory setup, and what happens on a, on a very small uh, spatial domain. Um, with this setup, we can go um, to the uh, 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 spatial resolution of uh, less than one millimeter, and this is based on an incoherent source. So instead of having a nice pure laser line, um, we have an incoherent broad source, but it is co-propagating, so it's the same incoherent source from both sides. Therefore, we have a correlation peak in the middle of the setup. This can be based on frequency modulation or on amplified spontaneous emission of an EDFA. Uh, and uh, some years ago, we showed that we can actually even go down to a, to a brion interaction on 200 micrometers. And uh, a third project that I'm also excited about is using um, twisted photonic crystal fibers, which um, can carry um, orbital angular momentum modes and which can couple um, to uh, transverse acoustic waves and also to longitudinal acoustic waves. So these are things that I hope to share results very soon. So this is uh, the, the current team, actually some I'm missing on, on the photo, and um, the, my collaborators um, from the University of City, where I was before, UTS, IPHT Jena, um, ANU, and University of Southern Denmark. With this, um, I would like to sum up. Um, I talked about the Korean transfer of optical information to acoustic waves. Um, how to reinforce acoustic phonons, that we have access to different domains in terms of sensitivity, dissipation, and frequency, um, how to use this unique nonlinear effect for parallel signal processing, and we're excited to study sound waves with OEM and electron structures, and investigating the strong coupling routine of SBS. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm thankful for everybody. So, Birgit, that, that was a fantastic talk. I, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, thoroughly, there are many, many questions that people have asked already. Uh, Jerry, will you take over again? Uh, with pleasure. Thank you. Um, I please remind everyone that uh, you can add questions to the Q&A section. Um, but um, if you'll indulge me, I had a couple of questions of my own. Um, um, I was wondering if it would be possible to um, couple a, a resonator to the waveguide that you showed, such that you could hold the acousto optic, uh, sorry, the, the acoustic waves in a resonator with a longer lifetime um, and therefore extend the read-write process, but still within that acoustic 
the still while it's held in that resonator, still be able to access it from the rewrite process. Like for example, could you have your waveguide become an air bridge structure that could hold some kind of off mechanical wave and therefore act as a as a mechanical resonator for the acoustic modes that you're trying to hold? So, so let me understand this. You want to have a waveguide and it's next to the waveguide a resonator where the acoustic waves are traveling or, or the resonator is, the, is vibrating at their mechanical modes? I, I was thinking oh. vibrating at the mechanical <laughs> modes such that the resonator could hold your uh, acoustic mode for mm. longer than what you were observing in just the um, straight waveguide. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, there, you, you could, you can do this. So there, there are also um, studies on um, exciting traveling acoustic waves in a, in a resonator. However, the lifetime stays um, still the 10 nanoseconds, which is due to the, to the uh, material. Um, except for if you continue putting in light waves and exciting them. If it's this, what do you mean? I mean, you would yeah. need probably, or maybe you think about a, a high Q acoustic resonator. I, well, I, think, I think that's perhaps my idea isn't fully formed but yeah. I think that's what yeah. I had in mind is a way in which yeah. you could just trap that excitation mm -hmm. in a resonator mm -hmm. just to I'm, I'm thinking it purely from a functional point of view yeah. but trap yeah. that yeah. Mode yeah. in a resonator yeah. to extend yeah. the time between reading and writing. I mean the good thing is that in the resonator you can trap the light also very 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 nicely and that's why um, you you can excite it again and again but the, I think the acoustic lifetime will is still limited to the, to the material. So, so my second question is, if I understood you correctly, you mentioned that the theoretical limit for how long um, such light could, or such information could be held was, I think you said 350 nanoseconds. Yeah, yeah. it's an so, estimation, right? <laughs> so, no, that's fine, but I, I was hoping you could maybe expand on that a little bit. I understand where, you know, material properties could limit that, but at the theoretical limit, what is the restrictions that gives you that, that 350 nanoseconds? Yeah, so one thing is the signal to noise ratio um, that, um, so the signal to noise ratio at the beginning and at the end. And we, uh, we anticipated that we have a certain um, line with a pulse width of the, of the uh, control pulses. So with every, um, every refresh process, this um, acoustic wave gets broader and broader and broader. And at some point, this um, uh, compromises the efficiency, of, of course, of, also of the, of the readout. Then we took into account also um, noise, um, yeah, thermal noise, so a certain um, seed that is always present because of this, uh, the, extinction, uh, the limited extinction ratio of the modulators, and all this um, got into this uh, estimations to, yeah, to bring us to this number. <laughs> I see. Thank you. Um, I have another question here um, have from, uh, from Dr. Alam asking, has, have you or anyone else shown the storage of spatial information of light using Boolean scattering? Spatial information, so the, the, spa the, the spatial mode. Yes. Of the, mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, uh, so the quick answer is I don't think so. And uh, the, the problem might be that, um, for example, if you, if you have two polarization modes, um, then you can couple, to, uh, in, in optics, you can couple um, to the same acoustic mode. So the, 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 the thing is that you, you probably can't distinguish um, the, the two modes um, due to the, the, the uh, yeah, because you excite the acoustic wave basically all over where the light propagates. Um, however, if you have a very distinct um, optical mode, maybe it, it could be possible, but I don't think it has been done. No. Okay, so like a higher order HG mm. mode or an LG mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this would be the case, for example, for particular OEM modes. Um, then you also right. excite certain, certain acoustic modes, yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Um, I, I think uh, with the interest of maintaining our schedule, um, I, I'll hold the questions there, but thank you very much for an excellent and, and thought-provoking talk. Um, Bob, I, I'm willing to give the floor back to you now. Okay. Ajir, thank you for handling the question and answer session. So uh, uh, just a couple of announcements. There is no poster session today. We had a poster session on Wednesday. There'll be another one on Friday. 
but right now, the uh, uh, as soon as we sign off, uh, we will be done for today. Come back again tomorrow. Uh, the first two days were great, and the third day will be uh, just as great. So uh, let me close just by thanking the, the two speakers, uh, Dr. Stiller and Dr. Gook, for these fantastic talks they gave us. And uh, I guess we can sign off now. So bye, everybody.